Welcome. I'm Dr. Johnson, and you're either sitting here because you found a comfortable seat. Want to get off your? You want to get off your feet? No, no. Okay. Sorry about that. No, but no back support. Um, or you're here to hear about uh, treating floaters, which I, I can guarantee you that you're not going to hear this anywhere else at any other booth. This is not another lecture on macular degeneration and cataracts and, and, and all that. Not that those aren't important. This is this is what I do. Um, a medical director of a, a small niche boutique practice in Southern California, and uh, I believe I'm the only one that is exclusively treating floaters. And when I say exclusively, I mean that all I do is I treat floaters. And you might say, how boring could that be to do the same thing every day? And I tell you, I am just amazed by what walks in the door. Every person is different. Every eye is different. I'm challenged. And just when I think that I'm kind of getting the hang of it, a something new will walk in and challenge me. Um, there are just a few of us in the country, though, that have uh, significant, significant experience treating eye floaters. I know there are some others that dabble with it here and there, um, and I have some advice on that. Uh, my experience, I've done several hundred patients, uh, probably over 2,000 procedures, and if you look at the numbers, it becomes self-evident that this is, not, this is not like cataract surgery where you, you, you do your surgery, you look at it and you say, I'm 100% done, next patient. Um, there's some variability in the number of treatments that each patient may need. Uh, as, as well as the uh, numbers involved in treatment. Uh, unlike a capsulotomy, 20, 30, 50 shots maybe, uh, we're dealing with hundreds of shots. It's a very different procedure from a capsulotomy. Uh, what is the scope of the problem? Well, it's a very common age-related problem. Um, the, the event that I call it that's responsible for most of the bothersome and also very treatable floaters is the posterior vitreous detachment. Uh, that occurs in about 25% of 60-year-olds, about 60% of 80-year-olds. Some, you know, that the curves sort of get a little thinner out there as you get a couple st standard deviations out there. It can happen in 30 and 40-year-olds, but not nearly as common. So it really is a, a more of an age-related phenomenon and considered normal by the profession. Um, in fact, it's not only considered you know, normal, but almost a relief that the patient has just floaters, just floaters, I keep doing the air quotes here, just floaters, uh, instead of the more pathological retinal problem, retinal hole, tear, detachment, bleed, whatever. So um, the most common advice then as a result of that attitude is, well, learn to live with it for the most part because you don't want to do the vitrectomy. That's, that's a very invasive and very dangerous procedure. Um, and so because of that, then the, the vitrectomy is, is very rarely offered. I'm, I, I think the vitrectomy is a good procedure and should probably be more commonly offered. So what is the disability that people experience from floaters? Well, uh, there was a, a study published um, last year in the American Journal of Ophthalmology where they asked patients who had various eye conditions and, and general medical conditions to assess the utility of that condition. I don't like that term, but the idea was that a, a 1.0, the highest score, would be perfect health, no problems. A 0.0, .0 would be death or something equivalent to death, whatever that is. Uh, and so some, every medical condition that they had would be somewhere scored between zero and one. They found that the self-assessed utility of the floaters was um, equal to macular degeneration. So the patients who had this felt that it was as bad as people who had ma macular degeneration and was considered to be a worse condition than diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, and as far as general medical conditions, uh, worse than mild angina, mild stroke, colon cancer, and asymptomatic HIV, as well as others. And they found no difference between new onset floaters about a month in versus uh, floaters that were older, uh, present in, uh, for over a year or so. So this idea that it'll just get better or you'll get used to it or your, your brain will adapt to it doesn't really quite play out. And that's, I think we're taught that in our training and we just sort of self-perpetuated and that's kind of some platitudes of reassurance that we very commonly throw out. And I say we because when I was doing general ophthalmology, I did the same thing, I'm sure. Uh, Dr. Jerry Sabag out of Orange County as well, uh, I consider the godfather of vitreous, um, in an editorial comment on this study, he said that uh, floaters have a significant negative impact on the quality of life. It throws into question our long-held belief that their symptoms will lessen in severity, either due to settling or ad adaptation or just time. And that's uh, really sort of the gist of my, of my practice. This here is a small gallery of floaters. Um, Everything from the simple and isolated Weiss ring to just a soupy mess to uh, something similar to Edvard Munch's The Scream uh, painting. All of these came into my office after the patients had been told once, twice, thrice that you just have to learn to live with it. Now, if any of you do microsurgery like cataract surgery, retina surgery, 
Um, can you imagine having this moving across your vision every time you were trying to do some kind of delicate procedure? I think that you would probably agree that it's uh, not the most nice thing to have in your vision. And these things are really, really, really do affect the quality of life for these people. And of course, not everybody is doing microsurgery. And I've had patients that are pilots. And of course, these are quite obviously very important for their quality of life. But, but really, if you look at what we all do all day long is we have a lot of screen time. We're processing a lot of visual information. So if you're a software engineer, if you're in sales, it doesn't matter. You know, the vision to that individual person is important. So really, we're dealing with quality of life issues for them. The history of YAG, uh, 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 many people will say, well, isn't this experimental? How long has this been around? Well, it's actually been around for, for two decades or longer. Um, but admittedly, there aren't very many of us doing this. There's uh, really, I'd say, probably three of us with significant experience in the US, several more in Europe uh, that are treating floaters on a regular basis. I, I know that there are others that are dabbling with it and maybe on a case-by-case -case basis might kind of try to get a little frustrated with it. Um, but there's just a few of us. There are um, also admittedly few good studies to really back that up. And as scientists, you know, you know, show me the evidence, show me the numbers, show me the data. That's valid, uh, few in number. Um, I think one of the problems with that is it's very hard to document eye floaters. Um, you could take a photograph of it, ask the patient to shake their head, the floater will move out of the way, you take a photograph and it looks like you just cured them. Well, the floater just moved out of the way. Uh, same thing with video, uh, they don't show up well on ultrasound. And you know, the real reality is it's really a very subjective phenomenon. It's like trying to measure pain or maybe tinnitus that somebody might have. These are very subjective uh, um, aspects and how do, you, how do you measure that? In fact, the pain studies very often have that, that, that scale of you know, sad face to happy face and neutral face and that's about as sophisticated as measuring pain can get. It's kind of where we're still kind of stuck with, uh, with treating floaters. So, Coming up with a bulletproof, really convincing study is, is a challenge, and that's a challenge that, that we're trying to work on. I think it's important. The other thing about the studies is uh, the, 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 the energy levels and everything were really kind of all over the place. So this is certainly is not a standardized and certainly not a commodified procedure. The physics of the laser, um, you know, many of us in our residency training are just kind of planted in front of the YAG and say, you know, aim at the capsule, make sure it's lined up, and then just fire away and create a little hole. It's kind of what you do. Um, I don't remember getting really a lecture on the physics or the, or the optics of the laser. Essentially, as I explained to, to anybody who'll listen, the YAG laser has a cone-shaped energy pattern uh, of about 16 degrees. And there really is kind of a quantum delivery of that energy. Uh, the laser energy will pass right through the cornea, right through the lens, and it only delivers at the apex of that cone. And that, the apex of that energy delivery area is a very, very small four to eight or so micron spot size. Very, very short duration measured in nanoseconds, of course. Um, the effect is that there is this plasma formation, uh, a photo disruption, and optical breakdown. The goal is not just to break the floater up into smaller pieces, but actually to vaporize it. And when you see the treatments, you'll actually see gas bubbles coming off. And at the end of a good treatment, you'll, st you'll look at it and say, that looks pretty clear. It isn't just a lot of pieces all over the place, but it's actually pretty clear. Now that's primary goal. The secondary uh, effect is that you are sort of breaking it up into smaller pieces. Some of them microscopic and solubilized, and some of those I think will find their way through the, uh, through the um, trabecular meshwork and secondarily get cleared out that way as well. Uh, but the, really the goal is that there would be less material present than when you started out. Um, and in fact, this idea of having, you know, it would be worse to have multiple small floaters than a large floater. Think about the last time you saw somebody with asteroid hyalosis brilliant. You have this brilliant reflection of thousands of, of crystals all over the place. And if you ask the patient, very often they don't have the symptoms that you would expect um, because those very, very small crystals cast a very small shadow. Remember, the patient is not seeing the floater. They're seeing the shadow cast by the floater. And if you have small little trailing shadows that don't meet the, meet, uh, the retina or don't reach the retina, they're not going to be very symptomatic. So even if I'm not able to get 100% of the floaters, you can have a very uh, a happy patient. And that's really what I'm treating the patient. So kind of going back over the, uh, the laser energy, uh, we use a treatment contact lens. There's a cone-shaped energy pattern. The uh, energy is delivered at the apex here, and of course, you know, as it dissipates on the other side of the cone there, uh, able to pass through the cornea, the lens, and not deliver any energy to the retina as long as you stay away from those structures, which is really the key to safety. Uh, there's a, a small surrounding shock wave, uh, very limited to maybe one, one and a half millimeters or so and uh, which brings me to kind of the, the demilitarized zone 
you got to stay away from the retina and stay away from the lens. If you can do those two things, this still gives you a pretty large working space here. Um, it, the, the procedure is very low risk. This is supposed to be a video. It ended up just being a, a, a screenshot of it. Um, I, I love this one because it looks like the skeleton reaching out there. Actually, the bulk of the floater was back in here. And uh, just to kind of show that even these, these very, very large floaters can be treatable. I really wish the video worked here. And there we go. Who's a candidate for treatment? Very broadly, when I communicate with people by email or by phone or through my website, um, the first question I ask is, how old are you? It is really the discriminating factor across the board. Some of the most depressed, despondent, anxious, uh, crazy, crazy patients that will come my way are the younger patients, young guys in their 20s and 30s, software engineers, kind of type A. They are crazy about their floaters. They will describe their floaters as little crystal worms, little specks, little spots. Um, they are almost universally very, very close to the retina. You just can't treat those. And it took me a long time to finally realize that I just can't do this. And so uh, on that section of my website, for the younger patients, I'm Dr. Pessimist. I'm Dr. I can't, I can't do this for you. Um, very poor candidates. The more likely to be treatable are the older, older than 45 to 50, particularly if they've had a posterior vitreous detachment. These are really good candidates for treatment. The floaters have pulled away from the retina. Uh, they tend to sit in the middle part of the eye or middle front part of the eye. Uh, the Weiss rings particularly tend to be pretty well stabilized and, 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 and slightly off center axis, but a good position to treat. They're very, very like, I probably treat 90, 95% of those patients. The in-between group, eh, they're kind of all over the place. They're a little bit harder to, uh, you have to kind of just assess them on a case-by-case -case basis. Managing expectations is a big part of what I do. Uh, it's very, very important for the patient to understand that this is not magic. This is not the sort of one and done LASIK. It is, it is not a, a software algorithm di driven process. Every eye is different. You really do have to help them understand that this may take more than one treatment and sometimes two or three or sometimes more. The, the goal is not crystal clear vitreous as you might get with a vitrectomy. It is, it is, in fact, I would define a successful treatment as getting them uh, really functionally happy, getting them to a point where they can go about their activities of daily living, working, reading, social, sports and such, and not being particularly aware of their floaters for long stretches of time. It's the functional definition of success, it's a little wishy-washy, but you know what, that's enough to get them happy and improve the quality of their life. Um, again, ultimately a satisfied patient. Risks, uh, again, you have to really keep the, that, you have to be very mindful and very aware of where your focal point is. There, there are red focusing beams, there are, there are aids, uh, depth of field, there's a, a narrow um, focal point. So there are many aids to know where you're located, but you really do have to keep them away from the retina and the lens. Um, a third is an elevated pressure. I've, and again, after, after about 2,000 procedures, I've had seven or eight patients with a markedly elevated pressure, it came on very quickly. I don't believe it's from the laser or the gas bubbles. I believe what it is is a, a scattering of, of, of soluble debris from the floater, collagen debris that it gets into and gunks up the trabecular meshwork. So I'm a little bit better at finding those patients in advance now and, and kind of warning them or maybe doing very, very light treatments, kind of a, as test treatments to see if they're a responder or not. Um, but again, still, the, the numbers are relatively low. And these have been treatable and eventually resolve after maybe one or two months or so on, on medications. And I think it's a matter of the, the, um, the macrophages and the trabecular mesh were eventually kind of cleaning that out. Oh, and the, and the fourth one, which is really not so much of a risk as it is, well, sometimes you just can't get them to the point where they're happy. Well, they can always go on to a vitrectomy. Um, there's nothing that I would do that, that would preclude that. And, and maybe the approach is doing the less invasive, uh, less risky approach first, because they could always go to vitrectomy, quite possibly. I haven't had very many patients that have gone into a vitrectomy, but I, that might be the, the, the thing to do. Um, big picture in, in conclusion, uh, treating floaters works. Now, why would I want to sort of give away the secrets of what we do? <laughs> um, this is a real struggle, and I think that we could be faulted of keeping this process very exclusive to what we do. Uh, why give away the goose that lays the golden egg is, is this statement. I think that you have to Give, give that away in a way and, and teach and train others in a way, um, A, it's good for humanity. Uh, the other is it further legitimizes the procedure. Uh, right now we're just a few exclusive guys working under the radar and it kind of, uh, yeah, it's a little suspect. If, if this really worked, you know, why we would be doing it as well. 
So I think that if more people are doing it, more awareness, more skills, and more smart people developing better techniques and better lasers to do this, it'll all be better in the long run. Um, but as you know, medicine is a big ship that doesn't turn too quickly. Uh, talk to, well, if you could talk to Harold Ridley when he first put the lens in the eye, it was about 20 or 30 years before that finally became an acceptable procedure. Um, but ultimately, uh, we're working on the quality of life. And I think that's something that ophthalmology, optometry, we've really sort of missed the boat on is just recognizing that this is a real problem, a real condition for these people. You just have to, you have to listen to the patient. Um, and I think that's where we're not meshed. We haven't traditionally meshed very well. The patient will complain bitterly about their floaters and we're like, yeah, but the good news is it's not a retinal problem. And that is good because that is real pathology, but you really have to listen to the patient. This is a real problem for them. I believe the vitrectomy is still the gold standard. Um, it has the greatest likelihood of getting rid of everything. But as we know, it's more invasive. But also, um, and if there's some retina people here who might concur, I think the, the, the culture is generally that we don't want to do a vitrectomy for just floaters. They've got a waiting room of real pathology. They've got retinas in all kinds of states of disrepair and, and, and flapping in the breeze with retinal detachments and such. The floaters really seem kind of minor. And I think also with their experience, you can do a perfectly performed vitrectomy and then see things go awry later on, you can, uh, infection or, or retinal detachment later on. So I think particularly with some of the younger patients, they're just very reluctant to, to do a procedure that might eventually cause a cataract and, and you know, more problems down the line. So the vitrectomy is the gold standard procedure, but, I, but it isn't very practically available. And so that still leaves the, the laser as another option for some people. Um, there's a, a fair amount of variability in the efficiency. Again, going back to managing the expectations for them, I think it's very helpful to deal with that. But ultimately, I think it's been a very low risk procedure. There is a long, slow learning curve with this. So anybody who's thinking about uh, uh, doing this, I would start with the, the simplest and straightforward procedures to begin with, such as a Weiss ring, very well positioned. Um, isolated, and you can get some very good results with that. But ultimately, you have to get in and do it. Um, and again, it's all about quality of vision and quality of life. And that's me, and that's, uh, you're going to start on something, that's what I'd start on. Something nice and isolated and uh, with very, very good, good results with that. It's a lot of information. A lot, I could talk forever about floaters. Are there any questions that anybody has in particular?